The All That and Mo podcast takes actual money to produce. My producer has a family to support, and I have to support him because I'm all about that. And I am so lucky and so fortunate and so excited to thank all all of the folks on Patreon who are helping out. And I want to give shouts out to my Patreon peeps. So we're starting with the Add a Positivity Project. I see you out there. Thank you for your donations. Tawny, the mostly harmless, rad. Stephanie Chernikoff, awesome. Scott J, dope. Sarah Leslie. No, Sarah Lieste. Lieste. Lieste? Oh my gosh. I suck. Sarah you're amazing. I apologize for butchering your name if I did. Minnow and Blossom, you're gorgeous. Meg Baca, thank you so much. Marty Wilder, amazing. So dope. Marshall Flax, mwah, delicious. Killer B, 1973, thank you so much. JP Robichaud, JP. I know you always got my back, bruh. Joanna Spencer, Jojo to my mojo, who's known me since I'm fucking like five years old. Joe, thank you. I love you. Hadera Copley Woods, thank you so much for your awesomeness, for your donation, for your persistence. Esther, you're amazing. You're beautiful. You're fantastic. DK, shout out to my home bro. Thank you, honey, for supporting me and supporting this podcast. Anna Biddle, you're gorgeous. You're amazing. You're fabulous. Thank you. Andrea, doing it, doing it, doing it well. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Amy Willert, you are a fucking rock star. Thank you. Eric Meredith Goujon, one of the most brilliant artists that I know. You're the bomb. Love you and so appreciate your support. Now I move to the second tier, Liz Scott, who is a longtime personal, personal friend. I am so very fucking grateful for your support. Thank you so much. Elizabeth Scott, and to my latest and dopest patron, Healthy Life, who is in the champagne room with me. And if you ever choose to join Healthy Life, you will also receive the benefit of all the secret Patreon early releases. And as well, you are entitled to some of my time. So check out patreon.com, all that and Mo or Melina or whatever the fuck it is. I don't know. There'll be a link in the description because my producer is amazing. Thank you. Thank all of you so much, because without you, I really wouldn't be able to continue doing this podcast because I can't just keep hemorrhaging money forever. So you are helping me to bring the word to the world. Thank you. I love you. What are you doing? What? Stop, stop. Have you listened to part one? You have? Okay, okay, fine. I just... I get a little defensive when I have two-part episodes. I'm worried that people are going to not freaking hear the first part and then just listen to the second part and be like, this bitch is not making any fucking sense and start cyber-stalking me or doxing me or some shit, which is outrageous. But you know what? Crazier shit has happened. If you have already listened to part one of this lecture, that's great. If you have not, please go back to the previous episode. Give it a listen. And then come back and uh, hit this one. Yeah, that's what you should do. Because I love you. And because otherwise it won't make much sense. No, it will make sense eventually. It will just, just, just go listen to the other episode. Okay, gosh. Good grief. One of the things I want to talk about especially is issues of uh, problems and conflict resolutions when you are struggling because you are a person who is shy and or has a difficult time with sharing who you are. And again, from my very first relationship, one of the things that I learned that was incredibly helpful was to have conversations in every way we possibly could. So email was as valid as a face-to-face -face conversation, but sometimes you do want to have a conversation where you are with the person because it's very important, but you still have that difficulty. And one of the beautiful things that we came up with was a back-to-back -back conversation. So we would sit on the bed or on the floor on a mat, completely back-to-back -back with our backs pressed against each other and holding hands or, or not, or just you know touching each other somehow so that we could feel each other's breath and feel each other's presence and know they were there and listening. But you didn't have to look at them. You didn't have to see them. 
And I found that really actually remarkably helpful for me in some really difficult conversations that we had to have. So I encourage that. But the thing is that there are hacks and there are tricks and there are tips and there's everything you can do and, 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 and listing all of those. Like I used to do this thing where I'd be like, here's 10 helpful tips, but I'm like, I don't want to do that because it's not about what I have done that has worked for me because you need to figure it out. And the way to figure it out is to start with compassion for yourself. And I don't know about you, but I have like also in addition to the shyness, also low self-esteem stuff. So my trick for helping myself is to say, what if my best friend was in front of me with this problem? What would I say to them? Because I'm so much nicer to everyone else than I am to myself. And so how I trick myself into being good to myself is I treat myself as I would treat someone I loved until I learned to love myself. And I'm getting there. I'm a lot better. But it still can become very difficult when you have to share something that's tough. Um, my owner and I uh, have a really hard time with this. He has a great deal of trauma in his history. Uh, he has um, a history of every kind of assault. He had abuse in his family and outside of his family. Uh, his family were also Nazis, you know, so there's that. And uh, the abuse, the intergenerational trauma that he brought into our relationship was shocking to me. I thought this was the dungeon. What's going on? <laughs> I was like, obviously, it's getting spicy outside. Excellent. <laughs> no, that's too, too young. I was like, no, no, leave it open. This is awesome. <laughs> I was like, no, 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 no kids. <laughs> Uh, what was I saying? What was I saying? Yes, trauma thing with the stuff. What I needed to learn um, was that folks who are trauma survivors, people who are living with trauma backgrounds, their issues in terms of communication are, are often even more complex. So if you are someone who is living with trauma, who is living with abuse, that also can be something that is making your communication difficult because you have experienced negative blowback when you have shared who you are, when you have expressed a need or a want or a desire. So I want you to honor that. It doesn't mean that you have to push through everything. You don't have to become braver or stronger or louder. You don't have to have a bunch of tricks in your bag in order to figure out how to talk to people. There are so many TikToks and YouTube videos and books that will give you a list of 40 things you can do to, to, to meet the next hot partner. <clears throat> so those things are out there. I'm here to actually say, remain weird. Stay awkward. Because that is who we are. The world needs to change to suit us, not the other way around. We have so much to offer in who we are. I absolutely do not believe in pushing ourselves to become someone different, essentially putting on a mask, isn't it? To use these sort of chips and tricks to do whatever and to push your way into feeling braver. Just settle into and embrace the weird and the awkward. I, I, I truly deeply believe that that will be the way that you find yourself feeling truly authentically who you are and connecting with the people who are there for you and ready to experience you truly and fully and deeply in your present state. Right. So, yeah. So there's that. Uh, huh. Questions, thoughts, stuff. Anyone send me a thing? Forbes cars. <laughs> if anyone would like to, uh, know what cars to avoid buying. <laughs> I just opened this account last month. How does it have spam in it? How do they find you? <laughs> I have done, I have not even, oh, oh it's insidious. Um, what was I going to say? Yes. So one of, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Ultimately, I think, yeah, stay weird. Um, Oh, I was talking about uh, the negotiating and the ends of relationships. When you are, um, when your anxiety and when your inner monologue is holding you and binding you, one of the things I find that can be helpful and I do encourage you to do is to find a way to at least say that out loud. And this was something that I had to teach to my owner because when you grow up in an abused situation, 
saying how you feel or having a problem only got you more abuse. And so for him, even sharing his feelings was almost impossible. And I discovered over the first couple of years of our relationship that we have entirely different emotional speeds, right? My emotional speed is microwave. Something happens, I'm like, beep, boop, boop, boop. I know exactly how I feel about it. I know exactly whose ass I want to kick and how I'm going to do it. <laughs> I'm ready for some shit and I'm ready to talk about it and process it and do the thing. He is like, huh? And freezes. And I'm like, what's happening? Can we talk about the thing? Fine weather we're having. And like, he's fine. He's fine. Everything's fine. I'm like, I'm not fine. I will not be fine for months. <laughs> But then over the, and then a week would go by and two weeks would go by and then he would freak out about something and then he'd be like, and this other thing. And I was like, the fuck did that come from? That was two weeks ago. What the fuck, sir? <laughs> <laughs> if you put the sir at the end, it's always okay. <laughs> so the sir, ma'am, y'all, whatever your <laughs> respectful thing is. And it's all fine. But what was interesting is that this is the shit that had helped to destroy his previous three marriages, right? So instead of getting pissed at him, I took a deep breath and I was like, what's actually happening for you right now? Why are you, what's, what's really, I was like, let's, let's feel this because this is wildly disproportionate to what actually happened. And he took a breath and he was like, well, I think this, I think that. And then over the course of, you know, uh, the next few days, he would unpack it and pull it out. And that was his processing time and his speed and his reality. And I was just like, Jesus Christ, I'm going to kill this motherfucker. <laughs> but I love you, <laughs> sir. <laughs> Fortunately, we're mostly in America. And I'm like, I'm not going to prison in America. <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm not going to do it. Prisoner or table. I told him, don't fuck around in a Scandinavian country, though. <laughs> Their jails are awesome. <laughs> I was like, I'll have like a husband and a wife <laughs> conjugal visits and I'll get three degrees, write a screenplay and then come out as like the widow Haas. <laughs> My book tour. <laughs> but this is the thing. I had to learn where he was coming from and I had to come to that with a place of compassion. And I was able to do that because he finally was able to share his fucking weirdness. The first month we were together, I could not go to the store without him texting me 17 times. And I'm like, this is not going to work. I can't live like this, bro. What is your fucking problem? And I finally had a meltdown in the middle of Zabar's on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, which is a very fancy grocery store. And I'm sure they're just like, why is this fat black lady screaming into her cell phone at the fish aisle? And it's just like, I'm in the Zabar's where I was 10 minutes ago. I'm still here shopping for food for you, <laughs> sir. <laughs> What he could not tell me was that he was having panic attacks when I was leaving him because of some childhood shit that his mom did. And it took a year for him to share that. And I was like, what, what did you think I was going to do? He was just like, I didn't, I didn't even know if I knew it myself. And I was so touched by that. But this is the thing that happens when you are honest about who you are and about your fucking wounds, the places where you hurt. It's the most difficult thing to show someone else and it's the most important thing to show someone else when it's difficult for you to share because you're not giving other people the opportunity to know you. They don't know you if they don't know what a fucking mess you are and how your mess works, and how you keep track of your mess or don't. But the reality is we're all kind of a mess. And what you need to do is figure out if like your dumpster fire is compatible with the dumpster fire of the person you want to hook up with. And that's all it needs to be. It doesn't need to be that you need to be more brave. You need to be more whatever. You need to be less anxious. What you need to do is figure out how to live with those things comfortably. 
I just started a new round of therapy recently and I was talking to my therapist about how um, I had a, a, a an unpleasant Facebook fight with another therapist who also happened to be a friend of mine from high school. And I was talking about having to go to this opera party and I was just so the whole time, the whole time I'm standing there and everyone's like looking at me because I'm like the composer's wife and everyone's looking at me because I'm the only black person in the entire fucking party and it's super uncomfortable and I just don't want to be there and I'm this and this and that. And then I posted some pictures from this event and this woman, this friend, now ex-friend, this therapist said, wow, that doesn't really look like someone with social anxiety, does it? And I was like, can I get your client list? Because I just need to let them know that you're a shit therapist. <laughs> and a garbage human. <laughs> P.S. You know, but the reality is that smile, that big energy, that whatever, that was how I cope with being in that situation. What am I supposed to do? Roll up into a corner and cry? I'm there for my owner. As a slave, I get very fucking brave because I do it for him. That's my motivation. That's my thing. There's very few things that scare me if it's connected with what I'm doing for his sake. Those things I love. I have that bravery. If it's for me, pfft, pfft, nope. I would be hiding in the corner curled up. <laughs> that would be what I'm doing. But what I have found for myself is the places where I can be brave, the places and the ways that I can be bigger than life. And I step into those when I can and I shrink back when I have to. I gave myself permission to be a fucking weirdo. It's hard, but I've done it. And what I have discovered is that thousands of other people and probably most of your friends are right there with you. Each and every time I post some psycho shit on Facebook, 175 people are like me too. Yes, absolutely. Yes. This and 27 times, 24, seven, da, 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 da. Never once have I posted some fucked up thing or some moment of terror and had anyone go, oh, God, that's weird. What? No, that is just you. That has never happened. And so the more fucking awkward you are, the closer you will be to the person who is complimentary to your awkward, who either will pull you out of your hole or who will climb down there with you and be like, <laughs> we're just going to be the gremlins in the hole for the rest of our lives. And that's fantastic. I, I personally love being a weirdo whole gremlin. I love the fact that like Georg and I will be like, we'll travel to like the most beautiful place on earth and then he will sit facing a wall so he can compose. And I'm like, why are we in the country? Why are we here with this dirt? You could have faced a wall in Manhattan. <laughs> but he needs to vibe with trees. It's a whole thing. I don't know. I don't get it. I grew up in Manhattan. I grew up in East Harlem. I'm like, there's a tree. Very nice. Thanks for the oxygen. <laughs> I go about my day. I'm not trying to hug it or communicate with it. But that's just me. He eats food off the ground. Like he goes in the woods and picks shit and eats it. I'm just like, what the fuck is that? Put it back. <laughs> Don't put that in your mouth. He's like, it's delicious. <laughs> you guys all do that though. Austrians are all about like mushrooms and berries and shit. Fuck <laughs> is going on there. We went to the um, you know, the I'm sure none of you have seen The Sound of Music because none of you watch it, but it's a thing for us. <laughs> it's a thing. And so we went to the Von Trapp family. They have a, a ski resort in Vermont. So they basically were like, where is exactly like the Austria in America? Vermont, great. So they moved there. And Gerg was literally like, they have the same mushrooms. I'm like, maybe they bought them from Austria to plant them in the thing. But yeah, he was like eating shit off the ground and walking around. I was just like, I'm from Manhattan. It makes me nervous when you pick things off the ground and eat them. I don't care if it's nature. <laughs> Maybe like a duck peed on it. You don't know. Sorry, that was an odd tangent. <laughs> they were like, yeah, it was great till she started talking about duck pee. I'm like, not even sure how we got there. <laughs> uh, see, embrace the weird. Go for it. I'm just like, ah. Don't say that. But I'm just like, but I said it. It's too late. I said it out loud. Um, okay, so I don't want to. Uh, let, well, hold on. Let's see if we have any questions. Nice comments. Did it in? Maybe not. Maybe I can make up some questions. No, it's still just Forbes. 
That's all right. Um, just want to take a deep breath, get the feeling vibes of the room, see if there's anything else I need to say right now. Do you have any questions as the leader of the, of the pack? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Meow. <laughs> this is going to be like the new in thing in the Vienna scene. I was going to be like, why is everyone meowing? And they're like, mm -hmm. <laughs> You do? Oh my God, that's so sweet. <laughs> We have our house is like a, our house is technically called house wolf style because the first month I was with Georg, I was like, were you raised by wolves? Is this what happened? Like he stands there, like he opens a bag of bread. You know, there's like a, there's like a, what is it? The D and D chart, the orientation chart, like chaotic good. Chaotic neutral. There's one for like bread bags <laughs> and he's always chaotic evil. It's always like bag ripped from the side. And you're just like, what? Like, there's no way to save this. What did you do? <laughs> he just stand there with his pumpernickel, like, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> crumbs everywhere. Just like, the cleaning lady was just here. Sir, fuck. <laughs> fuck. He is a fucking weirdo on the spectrum, fucking everything, everything, everything. And the reality is, I adore that motherfucker because he is so fucking nuts. And because his nuts meshes well with mine, you know, my first dominant, when I first went into service and I was first trying to figure out who the fuck I was, I had all kinds of restrictions placed on how I could speak, what I could say, when I could speak, what I could say, how I moved in the house, all this shit. And I thought that was kind of hot because like, right, like you read all these books and your story of, O oh, and you know, the marketplace series and all these things. And you're like, oh yes, formal service. And I need like this and I have this position and whatever. After six months, I was like, this is exhausting. <laughs> I don't know if I want to do that. I'm fucking tired. And my dominant, who was a, a nice guy, you know, to be honest, but um, it turned out that the fact that I had a smart mouth was a problem for him. I was too sarcastic and too, too, too cutting and too, you know, mean. And so he, during one of our weekly meetings said, I'm putting a restriction on you. You are no longer permitted in this house to be sarcastic. And I said, that's going to work out really well. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, I just fucking did. Uh, I'll just go stand in the corner. <laughs> Here's your essay, sir. Um, I, what the fuck? What, what the hell is that? That's not, that's not a thing. It is not a thing that I need to change who I am in order to be in a relationship. And if that's true for that relationship, that is true for the rest of the world, and that is true for you. Don't fucking change who you are. Don't let people tell you that your weirdness is, is difficult. Don't let people ever tell you that you are too much or not enough. Fuck them hoes. Well, unfuck them hoes. <laughs> they don't deserve to be fucked. Because <laughs> even bad sex is still sex, right? <laughs> when I first met Georg, I had the most remarkable sexual experience of my life, which is that we were fooling around and he was kissing me in a way that was making me nuts. It was like open mouth and the thing with the thing. And I was just like, what the fuck is that? You know, you kiss people and they're just like, the, the, the mouth is too open. <laughs> and usually what do you do? You sort of try to give them signals like, see, I'm closing my mouth. <laughs> but he's too excited because he has like, you know, 38 J's in his hand. So he's just like, life is awesome. I can't hear you. And I had this whole conversation in my head where I was like, um, I'm just going to say, I'm just going to like find a kind, compassionate way to say, you know, this would be how I enjoy being touched. You know, like this is what I like in the thing and it's easy. And I was like, just find a kind, compassionate way to say the thing in my head. Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, <clears throat> and I pushed him back and I'm like, um, Kissing you is like making out with a horny sex frog. <laughs> and I'm like, Jesus, that was not nice or compassionate or kind of fuck, fuck. It's like, fuck. And he stopped and he was like, what shall I do? And I was like, 
um, uh, close your mouth a little bit, less tongue with the, you know, and we talked through it and I was like, oh my God, I completely like body slammed him emotionally. And he was just like, okay, tell me what to do. And I was like, whoa, okay. Oh, what? Oh, all right. Level, this is what's going on. Awesome. Yeah. And I was like, if he can take that, like the first time you're fooling around, you're just like, dude, awkward sex frog. We now have like 18 tiny frog statues around our house. It's very hilarious. Um, but what was amazing was that I realized that even my completely ridiculous, I will acknowledge that was ridiculous way to give someone feedback. He received it in a way that was actually fine. Like he didn't care. The idea that I didn't need to adjust my verbiage, that I couldn't be sarcastic, that I couldn't be loud, that I wasn't allowed to like swear in front of company or whatever the fuck it was. None of that was the case because his neuro spiciness means that those things just don't matter to him. He doesn't care. And so I can be as ridiculous as I want because it doesn't bother him. I have a friend who is in a long-term, you know, MS relationship, and she is a sort of person who is very intense. And it was hard for me the first year or so of our friendship to be in conversation with her because when she's talking to you, it's like this all the time. And it doesn't matter if she's talking about what you're going to order for lunch. It's like, I really want these nachos. <laughs> and you're just like, do you want, yeah, guacamole. And you're just like, God damn, bitch, fuck. Whew, I don't even want to ask if she wants salsa because then my, my eyebrows might like burn off. And I was like, this is going to be a hard to place puppy. <laughs> Married now for uh, almost 19 years to the same man. Do you know how, uh, how their relationship works? He is so far on the autism spectrum that he does not register emotions and voices at all. <laughs> you need to tell him what the fuck you're feeling. So if she's like, can you please make the bed? He's like, uh, do I need to do it now or in half an hour? <laughs> she's like, fucking now. He's like, okay, great. <laughs> I was like, this is fucking beautiful, man. Because he would be a miserable partner for me. Like, I would absolutely lose my mind in a week. And she would kill my owner. <laughs> she would burn him to death with her eyes. Like, she wouldn't even have to do anything. He would just collapse into a pile of dust. But if she tried to stem that and box it and hide it so that she could get lure someone into being closer to her, you know, like make sure that she took all of her meds and this and this and that. And then, you know, did her meditation, did her, like, fine, you can shift who you are. Or you can say, you know what? I am super like, I'm at an 11 at all times, aggro motherfucker, even when I love you when I'm calm and find the person for whom that doesn't fucking matter. Right. There's that whole, like, there's someone for everyone thing is so fucking true. And what will help you find that person is for you to be as loud as possible with your weirdness. Let them smell it. Let them chew it. Let them lick it. Let them get all up in your weirdness. Because then you will authentically be seen and you will authentically be loved and you will authentically have the scenes that are best for you. And that's ultimately what it's about, isn't it? It's about finding satisfaction. It's about finding joy. It's about finding connection. It's about being authentically who you are so that the authentic you connects with another person. Have you ever had those relationships where you're connected with someone, but it's not you? You know what I mean? Work relationships are like that. Work relationships, you are not going to be all you because it's not appropriate in the workplace unless you're me and you don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and you will come in and someone will be like, why are you standing at your desk? And like, I got my ass beaten real bad yesterday. I'm not sitting down. What do you need? <laughs> but generally we have to have not a persona, but we have to take, if we are all beautiful, sparkling diamonds, we have to show some facets to some people and some different facets to others, you know, and that's just life. And that's real. But 
Please acknowledge that all the facets that you have are valuable, juicy, sexy, delicious parts of who you are, and they're all worthy of love, even and maybe even especially the most damaged, awkward parts that are the hardest to love. Because if someone can love that part of you, that helps you love that part of you a little bit more as well. And that gets you closer to living in that state of authenticness. And that word gets used a lot. But to me, what authentic means is everything you are at one time. Everything you are at one time, not pieces of it pulled away because it doesn't look nice. Not saying, you know, like for me, for example, you know, trying to be a slave and looking around at all these slaves who are quietly walking three steps behind the master with their eyes downcast. And I'm just like, I don't want to do that. I can't do that. It is literally something I cannot do if I am to maintain integrity with who I am. I cannot be silent. I cannot let injustice pass. I cannot suck it up and take it. And I should not have to. And none of you should either. None of you should either. Okay, it's 8.30 and uh, I'm tired. Um, I'm going to check for messages one more time. I'm going to look away so that if someone wants to kick someone and have their friend ask a question, that that is still available to you. What is this? No, I don't want to know about the NBA draft picks. Ugh. Once Michael Jordan started playing, I didn't give a fuck about basketball. I was like, oh, look at that sexy bald man just being sexy and bald. And I was like, now nah, I'm done. <laughs> yes, thank you. You're amazing. Flogging, yes. That is uh, the the. I will you. I will talk about the term first. The flogging just means hitting someone, oh. right? Um, with a device. Now, the device can be anything. That's the technical definition. In the BDSM scene, floggers generally refer to something you'll see. It has a handle with a lot of strips of, of leather coming down, leather, rubber. Sometimes if people have brain damage, chain, barbed wire, it gets ridiculous. <laughs> so the flogger is the toy. Flogging can be what you do to someone, but you don't necessarily have to use a formal fancy BDSM flogger to flog someone. So it's a it's an impact play toy. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you for asking. Yay! Mm -hmm. That's why you got this question dance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Oh my God, you're awesome. Uh, 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 uh. Please proceed. Yes. Uh, well, the t today's talk, most of which will probably be muffled. <laughs> if you, it is, I, I'm posting them as part of my podcast. I have a podcast. It's on all the places that they do that. Um, it is all that and Mo podcast. And so uh, the first half, because yesterday's talk was like an hour and fifty minutes, so it's two. It's going to be two episodes. So there'll be one um, tomorrow, and then the second half will be next week. And that's where you can see it. Thank you for asking. I'm very bad at promoting myself. Yes, I have a podcast. It's called All of That and Mo. It's available wherever podcasts are podcasted. Yes, and I also have a website uh, for my new thing, Kink Doula, which is me talking to you about your fucking shit. <laughs> Basically, the idea of kinkdoula.com is that I'm, I'm, I've been for many years People have asked, like, I'd just like to take an hour and talk to you one on one. And I didn't have a business model for that. Now I do. So there it is. Oh my God. Yes, you're awesome. Uh, 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 uh. What's your question? Yeah, I, I, I will tell my producer to get over himself. He just. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I will definitely put it up because it should have something, even if it's not because it's a multi-directional. It should be okay. It'll probably be fine. Yes, I will. I will push through and I will be like, Cody, I know this hurts your heart <laughs> as a sound nerd, but 
he did get over it last time because I had another speech that I recorded and halfway through the mic got twisted backwards and was rubbing against my boobs. And it was like a, and he's like, I don't know. It's really rough. I, uh, I was like, calm down. I'm amazing. People will deal with it. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. Uh, 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 uh. What is your question? <laughs> <laughs> They're like, I forgot. Your ass was in my face. <laughs> now my question is, I was talking to someone that I was going to this talk, and the title, and one of the versions of the title is like, Shy Freaks. Mm -hmm. And that person went like, I don't like the title. Mm -hmm. like, oh, okay, so you don't identify as this, but well, I do. <laughs> And then you didn't talk about it much better. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, like, what, like, do you mean when you say freak? Yeah. I, I, I embrace terms like freak and pervert. Um, the thing about the term freak, and it's, I, I, I didn't even think about this, but people do take it in a derogatory term. In the African American community, it has a slightly different connotation. A freak is just someone who's horny. Right. In the African-American community, a freak is like a fuck machine. A freak is like someone who's out every Friday, like boning in the club and, you know, like out there, like doing the weird shit. You know, um, years ago, I had a really cute necklace that was two little handcuffs cuffed together on my neck that I stopped wearing because people kept thinking I was a cop. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, there is nothing worse <laughs> You could call me <laughs> ever. <laughs> so I was like, so much for this. But I was at a place in New York buying my morning bagel. And there's a, a woman behind the counter. She's from the Caribbean. And she looks and she's like, why'd you wear that for? And I'm like, what, this? She's like, yeah, why you have this? Are you a cop? And I was like, no, I'm not a cop. It's like, you know, kink stuff. Like, you know, BDSM, kinkiness, whatever. And she's like, I'm like, uh, you know, like whips, chains, tying people up. And she's like, I'm like uh, spanking. And the thing with this, she's like, oh, so you're just a freak then. <laughs> and I was like, yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And the transaction was completed. That's where, that, see, that's where it comes from. So in the U.S., freak is like someone who's like ready, you know. Um, and to get a freak. And to get freaky is to do the freaky things, right? Even with the negative connotation, I embrace it because I personally feel that as sexual outlaws, which is what you essentially are when you decide to do freaky stuff, right? I want to take away the power of shame. I don't want people to be able to use that word to shame me. If I come up to you and I'm like, yeah, I'm a pervert, bitch. What the fuck are you going to say to me now? You, you. <laughs> pervert yes uh <-huh. laughs> like now you've lost in the same way that bitch is no longer like you know now people are like ecstatic if I call them a bitch they're like she called me a bitch I'm like yeah bitch you know it is a camaraderie thing in the same way that the n-word among people of color is a camaraderie thing in the same way that um, dyke used to be used as a bad word and now it is used positively faggot used to be used as a word against people. And now people, you know, in the queer community, like joyously use the word in order to take the teeth from it. And so that is why I'm like, yes, we are freaks and weirdos and perverts. And that is fantastic. Right? Like pervert just means to do something that something to do a thing that wasn't intended. That's all it means. To pervert means to do something in a way that was not intentional, right? For example, there's a, 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 a charge in the courts in America, perverting the course of justice. What that means is you did something to interfere with the law, right? Um, anal sex is perversion, according to Christians, because it's not procreation, is it? Dick sucking is perversion. So congratulations, everyone's a pervert. <laughs> Like, liberate your vanilla friends. Be like, you know what? Do you suck dick? Congratulations, you're a pervert. Here's a secret handshake. Here's a pin. <laughs> because you are perverting what is intended by nature, right? And that's fantastic. Hell yes. Great. Wonderful. 
the more perverts, the better. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I, it's, it's too bad that the, um, the title was off putting, but no, 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 I'm saying for the, for this person that they did not get to like be in this awesome room with these awesome people and meet all these fantastic folks. Um, but yes, that, that's the reason why I embrace that is first and foremost, I love being a freaky. And the second part is I don't want it to be something that can be used against us. I don't want it to be an insult anymore. I want people to aspire to the level of freakiness that we have achieved. I want people to be like, teach me your ways, perverts. <laughs> because the world has so much to learn from us. You know, which is part of the reason why I'm like, can I just have an HBO show? Can I just be like the Oprah of BDSM and kink and just be like, you get a flogger and you get a flogger and you get <laughs> so rad. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was an awesome question. Yes. Oh my God. It's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to ask you about that. <laughs> 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 um, I'm a bit struggling to reconcile what you said uh, about being sort of multifaceted mm -hmm. um, creature and be and thus being different in different contexts. Right. But staying true to myself. Yeah. Um, if I'm, for example, going to work, yeah, I guess people will judge me if I wear something not not completely in the frames of, of what's expected. Right. Or if I swear like a sailor, <laughs> <laughs> it's just not acceptable. So, so where do you draw, or where would you say? has to draw the line between not being true to yourself to mm -hmm. fit in yeah. uh, versus, uh, versus saying it's good. And, and I would say I gauge that by my comfort level. Like, do I feel constrained or uncomfortable or awkward? I train myself to start to feel awkward when I'm not doing the right thing. You know those moments where you're like, you want to say the thing and you're like, ooh, that might be too spicy. And you stop yourself. And then like 10 minutes later, you're like, I should have fucking said the thing. <laughs> I keep track of those things. And then I, I say to myself, you know what? Yeah, maybe next time, because there's always a next time, I will say the thing. And part of it is appropriateness also. Shifting your behavior, depending on where you are, is not always about crushing who you are, right? If I'm in front of my friend's kids, I'm not going to talk about dick sucking because it's not appropriate, <laughs> Am I squashing my innate cock-sucking soul? No. I will just save that conversation for y'all. <laughs> and so I, say, I, I, I turn that facet to the fore when it's a good time for it. And it's the same way it is um, when you are moving through the world, when you're interacting with people. The, the discomfort I would say is, are you having to lie in order to be in that presence, right? Not wearing the t-shirt that says, you know, I shaved my balls for this, right? Like to the dungeon, hilarious. To work, maybe not. Does that mean that you are suppressing, sharing your naked scrotum with the world? No, it's just not the time for it right now, you know? And if not sharing with your coworkers that your balls are shaved makes you feel uncomfortable and you don't want to live like that, Find a job where it's okay to say that. <laughs> I will tell you, for years and years, I worked in banking, which is a place where it's not okay to talk about shaving your balls. However, my next job was a corporate job working for a website doing content editing for alt.com and bondage.com that at the time was owned by this psychotic motherfucker who then sold it to Penthouse and that was not any better. But the thing is being at that job, you know, what became awkward was like, you know, it, it was at that time, like Facebook just became available to every outside of college students, you know? And so people were like sharing memes and everything else. And like, I would have to, like, if we heard the boss coming be like, Oh, there's a kid. Sorry, sorry. Dick, 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 dick. I have son. Because <laughs> if I was not looking at dicks, he knew I was not fucking working. <laughs>
right? Mm -hmm. So in that instance, it was appropriate. It was okay, you know, and having a kitten on my screen would not be be like, that's not work. (laughs) Because we're not allowed to put pictures of animals up on alt.com because then it might be about bestiality and then you have a problem, right? So I would go by the, I would go by like, does it feel like you are just being appropriate versus I'm, I'm betraying who I am. And I don't feel that appropriateness will feel like betrayal. Does that make sense? I'll get to it. <laughs> but I, I, think it's an, I think it's an important question. And I think the best thing to do is to take a moment of awareness when, you do, when that feeling starts to come up, when you want to say something, when you want to do something, when you have an impulse that you're not sure where it's coming from, where it's going, if it's okay. But to me, what feels what feels bad is when I feel like I really want to do or say something and I can't because I'm afraid. That feels really bad. Um, and so for me, that's a signal to me to push through. If I want to do or say something and I feel um, rage and that's what's pulling me back is that I'm so angry that I'm afraid I'm just going to go off on the person, I will hold myself back. Not because I don't want to express myself, but because I don't know where my rage will go. I have a very bad temper. And that's part of the reason that slavery is really great for me because this collar keeps me calm. Because every time I'm like, stab him, stab him in the throat, stab him, no one will know. I'm like, whew, beautiful collar. Everything's fine. No stabbing. Take a deep breath. <laughs> and and actually, it, it does help me because part of my service training is Take a breath if you start to freak out. Take a breath if you're feeling whatever. And getting that extra oxygen in the body and taking a moment to re-regulate your system is like physiologically helpful, you know? So you can do that when you have those moments and see where it feels for you. Does it feel bad or does it just feel annoying? Like, I wish I could wear my shave ball shirt to work. Uh, Or I am being repressed as a person because I must express myself this way. Then put yourselves in situations where the ball shirt is acceptable, you know, see how you feel, see how you feel. Thank you. That's an awesome question. Yay. All right. Anyone else? It was like, I kind of want to see the dance, but I can't think of a good question. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, what's your opinion about dragons? About dragons? dragons? Yes. <sighs> <laughs> like real dragons or like? Because I immediately, of course, because I'm a fucking freak, as I'm wearing again, went to the, the fucking dragon dildo website. Um, <laughs> Y'all know about that, right? Everyone's like, no, someone doesn't know. There's a website called Bad Dragon. They make, yeah, this corner of the room needs this site. (laughs) You do, you do. They create uh, various insertable sex toys in some fascinating configurations. And sizes. And sizes. And functionality. They have some that ejaculate. So you can fill it with something that does not have starch or sugar in it. <laughs> Please, if you're going to put it in your body, if you have a vagina, don't put those things in there. But you can put things safely in there. They also have ovipositors, so you can pretend to be impregnated by an alien space creature. It was like, hmm. <laughs> this is my favorite thing about being a pervert. Is it like I can say this shit and people are just like, yes. <laughs> I'm just like, blah, 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 blah. So like, you know, tentacle porn or whatever. People are like, which tentacle porn? <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 gangbang. Like how many in the gangbang? What is the legal definition of gangbang? <laughs> um, I loved Dragon since I was like five and read the Dragon Riders of Pern series. Did, was that published in German? I don't know. It's one of these fantasy novels and there's a bunch of them and it's like, you know, this planet that um, is threatened by this shit that falls from the sky once a month. And so they have bred dragons to 
chew rocks and then shoot fire at the thing. And people bond psychologically with the dragons when the dragons are born. And so there's this whole ritual with the thing. And I was just like, all I want is to psychologically bond with a dragon and fly around and shoot fire in the air and save my planet. It's what I aspire to. So I really dug that. Um, I had a problem though, because in my generation, we were forced to be in love with this movie called The Never Ending Story. And that puppy dragon. Yeah, yeah. I was like, no, no, I don't believe in it. <laughs> I was just, I was so mad. And so then, like, I became like one of the kids in my friend group who was just like, Falcor is not a dragon. That's a dog. <laughs> it's a long dog. So I was pissed off. Um, I did not watch Game of Thrones, so I don't have an opinion on that. Why did I not watch Game of Thrones? I have a physical body empathy problem. And um, so certain types of violence I actually feel. And uh, I watched this one episode where there was a lot of stabbing and I started shaking and I was crying. And my friends were like, you should not watch this because if you can't handle this, it's, your, it's just stop. And I was like, OK, thank you. <laughs> and then I came into the living room to like get a snack and they like this. Someone's like the pregnant women getting stabbed. And I was like, what are you watching? What is this? So I don't know about those dragons. Um, I very much love uh, the How to Train Your Dragon Dragons. I love them. Those are my, I think those are probably my favorite of the dragons because I feel like they have such an emotional quality to them that I believe and I really like got down with. So I really dug that. Did that, is that, is that a good answer? Okay. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. Another question. Uh, 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 uh. Yes. So are you reading sci-fi fantasy? First question. And if so, are there any kinky sci-fi fantasy books you or someone else in the world? Oh god. Um uh, what is it? Um I I believe that oh what is the what is the fucking name of it? They, there's a tattoo on the thing with the No, it's a it's a there's a there's a whole there's a series of them. What? Yes, Kushiel's trilogy. Does that count? I feel like there's. A, I feel like that's Kushiel's trilogy is one, but you, you're like you're like since you knew it, you're like probably already read it. Um, <laughs> does anyone else have any suggestions? Because I don't have a lot of good sci-fi fantasy. I cannot say that I read much of sexual sci-fi fantasy, but um, I read Carbon. Yeah. If you, if you read the book, there's one that's okay. <laughs> oh wait a second oh my god what is that movie that from mexico <gasps> i found this movie because i was uh the advice that i gave to someone yesterday about looking for juicy tidbits on pornhub like typing in the most disgusting search string you can think of and then hitting <laughs> search and this is how i found this thing wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> like hold on so, so one of the, the question was, how do I find good, like tentacle porn, good, weird ass porn. And the two suggestions I make are go to Pornhub and just type in like anime, tentacle, ass fucking titty, elongating, whatever the fuck, all the nasty shit you can think of. And you will find some good shit. And then somewhere they rarely put what the name of it is, but some fucking nerd has been fapping it and will and will write what movie is this and then someone else knows and they can go to the internet and do the right thing and buy the dvd or buy the streaming version of la blue girl for example which is hours of tentacle rape which i just happen to really like um what is this movie fuck oh, okay there's a movie from mexico mexico movie <laughs> tentacle alien are you on right now? No, 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 no. I'm not. Here it is, here it is, here it is, here it is, here it is. The Untamed. <laughs> and how I found that was that there was one, and the thing is that this was, it's a, it's a real fucking movie too. This is the fucking thing, y'all. So it's like beautiful CGI as this woman in a barn is fucking this many tentacled creature. But like, it's beautiful. It's fucking beautiful. Like I saw this and I was just like, whew. I'm taking 
Yeah. We should just. Oh my God! You could have a movie night here, bro. There is a screen. There's. We already have a, a TV here. Oh my God, dude! I just I fucking jerked off to that like eight times straight just watching it the first fucking time. I was just like, this is insane because you know when they have like live action tentacle porn, and it's like some girl going ah with like you know a bad dragon dildo going like ah, and she's like oh my god, you know, and like some fucking thing. And I was like, that's not no, I don't want to see that. I'd rather watch animation. But this is like, wait a second, million dollar CGI tentacle rape, bravo, yes, thank you, thank you very much. And it's also spooky and it's also amazing and it's well acted. So. <sighs> Yeah. Yes. Oh my God. Thank you for your question. <laughs> okay. Question. He had been exploring previously in some small ways. His partners. It's it's the reason that I'm Mrs. Haas the fourth. My ex boyfriend, the pizza guy, who I mentioned earlier, coined a term. For, you know, he was like, he was like, you kinky people do your kind of poly. I like to do vanilla poly, which is you don't know what the fuck I'm doing. <laughs> and I was like, we're not doing vanilla poly. OK, we're not doing that. But that was his solution because his partners rejected him and really shamed him for any of his desires. So he went out and got it on the side. Of course. <laughs> of course. There's plenty. I mean, and there's plenty of people culturally who have different kinds of poly that's been going on for a long time, right? Like, again, I'm going to go back to the African-American community and look at the term baby daddy. Is that a husband? No. Is it a partner? No. But are you involved with them? Are they in your... Yes. Interesting. And then people are like, I'm like, you don't... we've been doing this for millennia. Like partner sharing and agreements and unspoken agreements and all of this, that's par for the course. You know, I had a polyamorous relationship when I was 15. There were no books, but we negotiated a flawless relationship. And the relationship ended because they made out with each other without telling me first. And that was against our agreement. And so I was like, now it's over. Sorry. I'm keeping him because the dick is too good. You and I are going to be friends because I love you, but we're not going to all be like Wendy, Lisa, and Prince anymore. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. We're going back. What was the, we were talking about, oh yes. So this was his solution, right? And so he, but he had not gotten fully involved in the community and the scene because while he was living in Europe, he was concerned that he would be like at a BDSM club somewhere and like some journalist would see him or, you know, whoever, and then he would be exposed as this horrible pervert. Of course, now he is exposed as a horrible pervert, but it's a very different time and a very different place. So he was very eager to get into the real time scene, which is actually the reason that he moved to America. He was trying to do an emergency crash landing on his third marriage. It was not working out. And he was like, I need to go somewhere where people don't know me and I can be free. And so because like, you know, he is who he is, he just was like his solution to that was like, let me just get a job as a fully tenured professor at one of the top universities of the world teaching music. That's just what I'm going to go do. And so he moved to New York in August of 2013. And we met that December on OkCupid. Okay <laughs> yeah, I had a profile there. He took a profile there. He, oh my God, you guys. He was like 60 and he was like, I am crappy at dating. I don't know how to do this. So he hired a dating coach. <laughs> well, this is a movie like that, like Hitch or something, right? Yeah, yeah. He hired a dating coach who coached him on how to answer personal ads. And he was good because he sent me the loveliest message and then I responded. And then I you know, was like, the only thing that wasn't good about his message was that his profile didn't have any photos on it. And I was like, this is interesting. This is interesting. I was like, you know, I'm not so shallow as to insist that you be some super sub, but I would like to know what you look like. And within 10 minutes, he'd sent me three of the absolute worst selfies I have ever seen <laughs> in my fucking life. They were so bad. It was like up the thing, eight chins, scowling, <laughs> hair in his face, you know. And I was like, all right, I'm going. <laughs> I 
I was like, if you have the fucking guts to send that, <laughs> I was like, this is, this is a living in the moment motherfucker. This is, this, this, this guy's doing it. He's doing, he's done the work. All right, good. Let's go. Let's do this. <laughs> you fucking weirdo. <laughs> so yeah, so I, um, it was very, it, it was challenging because of course to be 60 and to have like newcomer fever is really very interesting, especially from my position as the slave, whose job it is to procure the best experiences from my owner, but also to have to put on the brakes and go like, no, you can't play with everybody, sir. <laughs> you have to calm down. You have to get to know people. You have to like, you know, like them. <laughs> He's like, really? I'm like, well, if you want to be my master and you want to be in my life, then that's the guy you have to be, not those guys. It's very easy to be those guys, but you're going to be the cool guy. <laughs> Does that answer the, was that answering question? Awesome. Thank you. <gasps> oh my God. Yes, 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 yes. I can put that. I think I learned a lot of online communication today, but I think I have some issues to, to express my, my needs and my expectation towards like random people mm. I don't know yet. I think it's way easier to talk in my long term relationship. Um, so I was wondering if you have some tricks how to like yeah, one of the things that I have found very helpful are, um, and I'm sorry, are you talking about uh, play and sexual interaction and those sorts of? Mostly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things I find really helpful are these BDSM checklists. You know those? Sure, great. If you Google um, BDSM checklist, actually, we have one, uh, the book that I call authored, um, The Toy Bag Got. No, Toy Bag Guys in book. Playing Well with Others is a book that I co authored, and we have like a BDSM checklist in the back. But if you Google BDSM checklist, you will find dozens and dozens of them. And what it is is basically like an alphabetical list of things you can do, right? And then it will sometimes, sometimes I'll have a box like, I've done this, I haven't done this, I want to do this, I don't want to do this, whatever. Blah, blah, blah. The cool thing is you can fill this out in the privacy of your own home, in the dark, under the comfort, under the blanket, print it out, and then just be like, here, read this, and then run away, <laughs> right? And then be like, can you fill that out too? Okay, bye. You know, and have that be a great way to start the conversation because what it does is it gives you something to focus on, right? When you're having conversations, some of what happens, I know for me, is if I'm overwhelmed or if I'm really into the other person and I'm feeling like everything I say is going to be the thing that's going to make them run away, <laughs> Sometimes it's good to have an agenda and to say, this is what we're going to talk about. So to say, hey, I'd love to chat about kink stuff with you. If we both fill out this list, maybe we can have, and then you can have stuff to talk about. You can go through and start with like, hey, like, oh, age play. What do you think? You cool with that? You're not cool? Whatever. Here's my experience. You can, have, you can exchange stories. You can tell sexy tales. And that gives you something to focus on as you are negotiating with someone. And I have found that very helpful. Another thing I have found helpful to me is to assemble a little chart that is the needs, uh, that is the wants, needs, and no, what is it want, need, desire, or need, want, desire. Is that right? I think so. I, why? Oh my God. See, this is what happens when you're old. Your brain is just like, this is a thing you've been saying for 10 years and now you forgot it. <laughs> But the idea is to look at what you are wanting to achieve in this interaction with this person, not for your whole life, not for whatever, but just like, let's say you're going to play with someone and you think about like, what is the point of this scene? Where do we want to get from it? And to sit with the person or to have an email exchange with the person or a Skype or Zoom call with the person and just start from the very basics what do you want to do is a nice start. But then the real question is why? Why do you want to flog someone? That is the best conversation starter ever. The thing that you used to annoy your parents with, why? Because it's blue. Why? Because reflection from diffract, refracted light. And the, why? Because the sun and the, why? Do that with BDSM. Do that with your negotiations, because what will happen is you'll have to stop and think, why do I want to get spanked? 
well, I like the way it feels when someone hits me. I like the intimacy of it. I like to whatever. But the thing is that like, if you know the why, then you're giving that person so much more information about who you are. If the why you want to be spanked is because you enjoy the sensation of spanking, it's going to be a very different scene than if the why you want to be spanked is because you were spanked as a child and you have some residual trauma that you want to revisit. Those are very different scenes. And if you don't know that for yourself, it's going to be hard for you to communicate it to someone else. So it might be sometimes, I know for me this is true, sometimes a reason I'm having a hard time communicating to someone else is because I don't fucking know. Right? So I'm not saying that that's true for you, but it could be that in some instances, the reason you're having trouble sharing the thing is because you're not sure yet. You're interested in this person, you're attracted to them, or they're attracted to you, and now you're considering whether or not it's both ways. And then sitting and thinking about the why may help you understand what to say next. You know, to say, well, why do I want to play with this person? Why do I want to, you know, get beaten? Why do I want to see someone kneeling in front of me? What is that for? Who is that for? Who am I when I receive that? Who am I when I don't receive that? Just asking ourselves these questions can get us into the heart of the activity because ultimately I think the heart of everything is communication and connection. I truly believe that that's the reason that we're doing all of this shit, to communicate something. Pain is communication. Bondage is communication. All of these things are a form of sharing our ideas and thoughts with another person physically. Bondage is wonderful communication because once it's once someone has said that rope to you, it stays there. Words don't hang around. Rope does. So that's a communication. Everything we're doing when we're playing is a form of communication and connection. And when we can truly embrace that and say, you know what, I'm going to come to this from a place of curiosity and wondering. Or you come to it from a place of, I have no fucking idea why I want this, and I'm going to do it so that maybe I'll figure out why. You know, that's an excellent approach. If you don't know, acknowledge it. Say, I have no fucking idea. I want to try this because I don't know why the fuck I want to try this. That's a great way to go into it, but you must acknowledge it so that everyone involved is aware that this is an emotional experiment and can go into it with that open heart and open mind. Does that make sense? And, and, and I think that in the case of what you're talking about, breaking down communication into much smaller pieces, so it's not just like, we're gonna do a scene. It's like, why, what do you want? What do you like about me? Why do you wanna play? What do you wanna do? Why? You wanna tie me up, why? And maybe the answer is just, I like your titties. And in many cases, that is fine and that's enough. <laughs> You're like, great, I got titties, you got rope, let's do this. You know, and that's completely fine. Everything does not have to be deep and profound and weighty and emotionally ravaging. Shit can just be fun. You know, give yourself permission and just do shit because it's fun, but also give yourself permission to ask why and to be honest with yourself. And if the why is that you're a selfish whore, great. Absolutely. And I will say one last thing and then you can do what the fuck you want to do. Um, I have been with my owner. It will be 10 years this winter. Last. Oh, my God. You have a question? Yeah. Okay. Hold on. Pause. Remind me that I was going to tell the story about the. the no, no, no. That won't remind me. Uh, 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 pillow is the trigger word. Yes. Oh my God, you have another question. Yes, we were wondering. Yes. If one Yes. There is, I believe, a toy bag guide to knife play. I think. I don't know if it's still in print. Let me take a look. Knife play. Um, the other thing I will suggest. Here we go. Greenery Press looks like it is still available. Whoa, not there. Holy shit. Who the fuck? Who is auctioning this shit for $200? Uh, I'm like, it's a tiny little pamphlet. Anyway, it looks like it is 
Oh, this is the Amazon DE. Maybe it's cheaper in the US. There's one, a short book called The Toy Bag Guide to Erotic Knife Play. The other place to look is on Kink Academy. I cannot recommend that website enough. Kink Academy is a collection of online learning for BDSM kink and fetish. And it's dozens upon dozens of experts from all over, mostly the U.S., but some from other countries. And there are classes that you can download and watch. And I'm sure that somewhere in there, there's knife play. Let's see. I'm looking here. So King Academy, I have some stuff in there. Um, let's see. What is this? Ooh, look at you with the strap on. Oh, my God. I'm on the front page. <laughs> I'm so awesome. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, that's me. <laughs> so check out Kink Academy and um and look for the for the for the other thing. The other thing to do is y'all have a space here. Find a knife play person to come and do a class. We already have one. Yay! <laughs> He's like, yes, that's happening. <laughs> so get on the mailing list. Make sure you get on the mailing list. <laughs> um so yeah, 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 yeah. Knife play is good. I do like it. Very scary though. But also very good. But also very scary. But also very good. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. Look who it is. Wait, I have to do my dance. Wait a second. Sorry. Mm, 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 mm. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> sure. Um, one of the things that is most important to me, especially in particular in DS dynamics, dominance and submission, master slave, the places where the play happens mostly up here. So rope bondage and all these other things are very important and very critical, but I don't feel that those things impact my emotional self as deeply as my personal psychology when it comes to submitting and, and all that comes with that. As an alcoholic, it is intrinsic to that that I have self-esteem issues, right? You do not become an addict if you love yourself. It just doesn't happen. So one of the things I had to learn when I stopped drinking was what my value was as a human being intrinsically just without doing anything, just existing. And what I thought at first, and it was problematic, was that as a submissive and as a slave and someone who was very oriented towards service, that unless I was doing those things, I did not have an intrinsic value. Coming back into the leather community after going through rehab, after going through the nightmare that that was for me, I was ashamed at first because I was like, what, what am I going to do? How am I going to be this different person that I have to be when I'm sober. Like, I don't even know who that person is. And so because it terrified me, I did the thing I always do, which is I had a friend post an announcement on every single fucking message board in the Bay Area, on alt.com, on bondage.com, on callerme.com, which I'm sure some of you weren't even born when that website was up because it's old and disgusting as hell. <laughs> But I had her post the same message, like, hi, this is Melina. I'm an alcoholic. I'm in rehab right now, recovering. See you in a month. And that was my way to push past all of that. And what happened was something I did not expect. I started getting emails from dozens and dozens of kinky people I had known for years who were saying, I'm sober too. I've been sober for 10 years. I've been sober for 20 years. We're so happy that, you're, that you got help. We'll see you when you get out. We're waiting for you. And I started to have an inkling, a tiny little bit of realization that who I was as a human being was valued by these people. And so perverts were the ones who started to help me realize that I mattered as a human being. It was the kinky people first. And that was a way for me to start to let my self-esteem start to simmer a little bit and actually start to come back. And what was difficult for me is that there's a paradox of feeling like garbage and feeling like shit and that sensation actually being encouraged by some members of the community, right? Having low self-esteem, feeling like a piece of shit and a worthless piece of garbage is actually very useful if you are a dominant and also not willing to do the emotional work it takes to own someone humanely. 
If someone is like, I'm a worthless piece of garbage, I'll, I, I, thank you so much for even letting me lick your boots. Convenient for that person, isn't it? Not good for the boot licker. And so what I had to do was to separate myself from my slave self and say, what's important is that I have healthy self-esteem, that I feel good about who I am, that I feel intrinsically valuable, even if I am not owned, even if I am not slaving, even if I am not scrubbing your toilet. And what gave me that self-esteem actually was doing this, teaching, lecturing, being of service in the community, even though I was not owned. And so I took control of it. There were things I could do to assist myself in feeling healthy and valuable in ways that were actually beautiful. I spent 18 years looking for my owner. And people freak out when I tell them, they're like, oh my God, I wouldn't wait that long. I'm like, it's not like I spent 18 years crying in a fucking corner. I sure did not. I spent 18 years having amazing relationships and great play and meeting fantastic people and traveling the world and talking to thousands of humans. And then I met Georg. And at that point, I was ready to meet Georg because I needed to get my shit together to be strong enough to serve him. And I needed to feel good about myself and I needed to be powerful in order to do that. And that's when I talk about this necessary self-esteem is that the mistake that so many non-kinky people make is that slavery and submission is for the people who bend and are weak. And it is 180 degrees the opposite. There is nothing harder than submission. There is nothing more difficult than subsuming your will into someone else or to some other cause. And the thing is that there are very powerful submissives all over the world. Anyone who's in the armed forces is a powerful submissive. They submit. Anyone who's a parent is a powerful submissive and a powerful dominant <laughs> and essentially a switch. <laughs> and you're not even really calling the shots, are you? <laughs> power exchange happens everywhere. And when power exchange comes from a place of feeling weak and less than, it will burn you and destroy you. Power exchange coming from a place of I am fucking awesome and gorgeous and strong and beautiful and you are lucky to be able to put this collar on my neck, motherfucker. That's when I knew I was ready to be a slave. That's when I knew that I had healed myself enough to do what I wanted to do. Does that answer your question? Excellent, thank you, that was a good one. Yay! Woo! Do we have to, like, see, I talk for another 20 minutes. It's terrible. Pillow. Pillow, 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 right, right, right. thank you. <laughs> that was my wrapping up story, I totally forgot, thank you. So, Many years, this was, we were probably, I guess, like, this was before the pandemic, right? Was it? Yes. No? Yes. Yes. No? Yes. Anyway, a wow. few years ago. <laughs> it was a few years ago. And um, my husband is very much like, how can I put this kindly? No, oh, fuck it. He's a horny old man. <laughs> <laughs> He's a horny old man. And... Um, just wants to like do all the sex all the time. And uh, our sexual appetites are very different. I'm very much a camel, right? I'm like, fine, I'm walking in the desert. And then it's like, I'm, you know what, a little thing. And I'm like, drinking from the well for three hours. <laughs> and then I'm like, whew, that was amazing. See you next month. <laughs> and he is like a hummingbird. He will die if he does not eat every three hours. <laughs> and I'm just like, knock yourself out. I'm just going to be... Um, playing Pokemon <laughs> while you eat my ass. That's fine. I can handle that. Um, so we're constantly trying to figure out, I'm constantly trying to figure out how to have fun sexual partners ethically and in a way that doesn't make me feel gross. That's the compromise. And we have a friend, fortunately, who is like, like the king of all horn dogs, essentially. He's, have you heard of cuddle parties? Cuddle parties, you know, they're non-sexual um, it's a non-sexual gathering, so it would this would be a cuddle party venue. So yeah, like, party. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, bro, yeah. Oh man, then you have to bring Reed out here, and we have to have a, a cuddle party with like the original dude. He would love that. He would love that. Um, so he he and and one of his partners, the people who created this, basically it's a non-sexual physical contact event 
everyone's fully dressed and you negotiate and then you just have contact. You just lay together with like, you know, like you can hug or you can just spoon or you can big spoon, little spoon. And it's a whole thing. So this is like part of his shtick. He's also like, you know, um, sex worker and just a beautiful, amazing human being, lovely penis, everything else. And so, um, we have hooked up with him. And if we're in the same coast, we're like, read, okay, we're thing, whatever, whatever. So Gerg is always very excited when there's a chance for us to all have sex because uh, A, read is delightful and fun. And B, I don't get cranky about it. I'm oftentimes cranky about the other sex. And I'm just like, no, we can have sex with read. It's fine. I give you my blessing. But I was having this feeling of just like, <sighs> and it, you know, when a thought occurs to you and you push it away, cause you're like, that's not me. That's not who I am. No, 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 no. I would never be the one who would just lay there and let two men do me without having to do anything and just be totally physically selfish. And then I was like, oh my God, that's all I want. <laughs> all I want is to be the pillow queen and just be like, serve me. And I was too ashamed to say it to my husband, my owner, who like, there's nothing I can say this to. So finally I was just like, I had taken like my marijuana gummies for the night. So I was feeling loose and he was talking about this thing, getting all excited. I was like, I just have to say, I was like, I'm sorry. I was like, I'm still going to do this, but like, can we just do it? So like, I don't have to do anything. And he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, I just want to lay there. I don't want to, I don't want any of you like shoving your dicks in my face. I don't want you making me do anything. You can do what I want. You can do what I say. You can do what you want to me, but I don't want to have to do anything. Okay. And he was just like, <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, really? That's okay. He's like, that's amazing. So I was like, read, I'm the pillow queen. He's like, awesome, my lady. Very good. Thank you. He's just like, woo, titties, ass, dicks. Yes. He doesn't care. So I spent like, and then we had rented this beautiful house in the woods in California. It's very nice. And I was just like, so that my pillows the way I wanted to. And then I was like, have at you enjoy. And I was like, this is amazing. This is amazing. Like, this is what sex is about. And then I was, and then I was just like, God, I feel like I, I was like, oh, but, what am, but what are they getting out of it? I'm like, what are they getting out of it? They're getting all this out of it. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Plus, apparently, I am very delightful to observe while having orgasms. I know it's shocking. <laughs> but apparently, I'm ridiculous. <laughs> So they're just like having a contest, like who can make her go next? <laughs> who can make her like, oh, you got her to squirt. Like, oh, I'm going to try. Do, 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 do. It was delightful. They had a great time. I had a great time. Because I finally said, you know what? Fuck it. Fuck it. Fuck it. I'm just going to say the thing. And it worked out beautifully. And now I'm embracing that. I'm just like, yes, I'm adding that to my thing. I'm like slave, submissive, service, pillow queen. Do me all night long. Thank you very much. The 68, you do me, I owe you one. <laughs> and that was my truth in that moment. And it was fantastic. And I was so glad that I finally, you know, had the ovaries to say it. Right? Because for, so, for like a month, I was just like, mm, mm, mm. So put that shit out there, you guys. That's the only way you get it. No one can read your mind. And consent is important. So not saying something and thinking that people are just going to psychically figure that shit out is a good way to live a life of disappointment and sadness. Putting something out there, the worst thing that fucking happens is they say no. They can say like, no, ew, ew, you're gross. That's worse, I guess. But fuck them then. They will never know the joys of eating pie while you're watching tentacle porn and having your ass eaten out. <laughs> Oh, who doesn't want that <laughs> for themselves? <laughs> who doesn't want to be some part of that equation? Like anybody? No, there's something in there for everyone. <laughs> be the pie, be the ass. <laughs> oh my God, I hadn't even thought about that. Be the pie. <laughs> Next <person. Next> <laughs> People are going to be like, I hate pie. It's going to be your friend. It's just like, I don't like pie. <laughs> awesome. I feel like I have not, now I have talked for like way too long. I was just like, oh, he put two hours on the thing. I'm barely going to go like on 90 minutes. And I'm just like, Brr. 
Um, you guys, this was for me, I'm selfishly like, I hope you had a good time, whatever. I had a great time. <laughs> I very much enjoy getting to meet you, getting to know you. Thank you so much for being so brave with your questions and so wonderful. Um, I'm really very honored to be here and I am so thrilled that you are putting this place together. Um, it's, it's, it's so needed and it's so wonderful and your focus and your drive is just contagious and remarkable. And I know it's going to be a really amazing space and we will support you in whatever ways we can, whatever we can do to get the word out or to do whatever. I'm all over that. So fucking dope. You're very fortunate to have a space run by folks like this because I've seen plenty of spaces and plenty of places and shit gets gnarly when people don't have good hearts. And I think you're going to have a really beautiful, amazing space here run by some beautiful, amazing people. So thank you and thank all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to All That and Mo. Thanks so much for spending your precious, precious time with me today. My podcast is produced by Cody Crabb, theme music by Georg Friedrich Haas, as performed by Marcus Weiss. And I look forward to spending time with you again really soon. Mm-hmm.